Hello, and welcome to Arbonne International's Learn and Burn Audio of the Week series. This personal growth and development edition on the Arbonne Triple Crown features President Rita Davenport and Executive Regional Vice President Deborah Fox. Listen in as Deborah Fox explains how you can win the Arbonne Triple Crown. Hello, everyone. This is Rita Davenport, President of Arbonne International. Thank you so much for joining us for this training program. With me today is Regional Vice President Deborah Fox, who now resides in St. Louis. But just to tell you a little bit about Deborah, Deborah became an entrepreneur actually when she was in the second grade. Deborah, is this really true that you were making balsa wood fly coffins? It is. It is. <laughs> and colored pictures and selling them to your classmates. Yes. <laughs> well, she knew that she was going to be an entrepreneur for the rest of her life. She is also a vocal performer. She is an accomplished equestrian. She has won the title of Miss Rodeo Kansas. And in 1997, she really got smart. She joined Arbon. Actually, she was the president at that time of the American Modeling Association and now is a regional vice president in Arbonne with such an incredibly talented, large organization. She is here this morning to share an idea on how you can win the Arbonne Triple Crown. And as someone that is an equestrian, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Deborah, you you have to be an expert on being able to train on this. I Well, I would hope so, after all those years of riding and showing horses. <laughs> well, it's something I know nothing about, but I do know about Arbonne, and I know about your love of this company. And I'm going to step back and listen to you as you teach others how they can win the Triple Crown in Arbonne. Great, Rita. Thank you so much for allowing me to share. I'm honored that you asked me to share my thoughts today. I want to talk about a subject that I do feel very passionate about and a subject that I believe the majority of the consultants in Arbonne can probably relate to. I'm sure that most of our listeners have watched the movie Seabiscuit. And I just have to tell you that this movie was very emotional for me. And I first believed that it was because I grew up showing horses and my father and I shared that love. And I just thought that it brought back a lot of great childhood memories. But after reflecting on it a while, I soon realized why I was so impacted and affected by this movie. Seabiscuit, as we all know, was a champion. And he gave the world something to believe in when they really needed something to believe in. But it wasn't always that way. In the beginning, Seabiscuit was born, of course, a very small horse. In fact, he was too small to be a racehorse, or so they thought. He didn't have the right disposition. He ate too much. He slept too much. His stride was too short. He'd have to take a stride and a half or two strides to keep up with the bigger horses. In other words, he would really have to work twice as hard to keep up. Now, his owners decided that he just didn't have what it takes to be a winner or a champion, so they used him as a training horse. And what that means is that they would put him on the track with other horses that they were training to be racehorses, and they would purposely hold him back. They would teach him to run behind the other horse so that the horse, the other horse would learn how to be in front, so the other horse would learn how to be a winner. Well, someone came along, and they sort of saw the fight and passion in this little horse. They just felt that he, there was more to this horse than that. And they took the time, and I want to repeat that, they took the time to figure out that traditional training did not work for him because he had always been taught to lose. They soon learned that all they had to do was get him eye to eye with another horse, allow him to run neck and neck or pace that horse a little bit, and then instead of pulling him back, they would let him go. In other words, they would bring him up to speed and then let go, let him let him run. They figured out how to fuel his passion, and as a result, he became a champion. This little, no-value horse ended up beating all odds. You know, the story of Seabiscuit sounds like so many people that we run into every day in our bond. They've been made to feel that they can't be a winner because they aren't smart enough or pretty enough or tall enough or outgoing enough or, in our business, even fast enough, just like Seabiscuit. I find that so many times they're held back by their own fears, their own insecurities, lack of knowledge, which is usually as a result of their upbringing and the way that they've been programmed for many, many years. It kind of makes me wonder how many times we decide that people aren't right for our bond for various reasons. But, you know, we come along and we give people something to believe in when they really need something to believe in. Maybe we see the potential in them that they can't see in themselves. And we start them on this Arbonne journey. 
And I wonder sometimes if we really take the time to figure out how to train them based on their background and their experience. You know, just like Seabiscuit, his trainers had to figure out what motivated him. They had to figure out how to retrain him after he had been trained to be a loser for so long. You know, Reed, it would be really awesome if that's where the story ended with Seabiscuit, but it's not. Life got in the way for Seabiscuit, just like it does for so many of us. And his jockey, his name was Red, Red broke his leg. So they had to find another jockey to take over and ride Seabiscuit during this highly promoted and long-anticipated race. And again, he won that race using the same motivation that they had figured out. But in his next race, Seabiscuit broke his leg too. You know, in the equine industry, they put horses down when they break their legs. They just decide that they have no value. And I just wonder how many times in Arbonne, if a consultant isn't a top producer or they go through some crisis, that maybe we decide they just don't have all that much value either. I just know that the owners didn't have Seabiscuit put to sleep. And after months and months of rehabilitation, they not only ended up putting Seabiscuit back on the track, but they put his jockey, Red, back on the track with him. It was a double comeback. This is the part of the movie that means so much to me, and and it's the part that I think a lot of people miss. Here was this champion who had gone through a pretty bad stretch, trying to make a huge comeback, and he was trailing the pack of horses miserably in his comeback race. He just wasn't keeping up. He was struggling to stay in the race. There was a pride issue involved, I'm sure, and it just looked like he wasn't going to finish at the front of the pack like everyone expected him to do. But the jockey who rode Seabiscuit after Red was injured knew the secret of what motivated this horse. And it just so happened that this jockey was riding another horse in this race. And this is the key. This is what really touches me. He unselfishly gave up winning the race himself, pulled up his horse, and went back to where Seabiscuit was trailing the pack. And as he joined Seabiscuit and he matched his pace, He looked at Red and said, how you doing, Red? Is there anything I can do to help? You see, he allowed Seabiscuit to get eye-to-eye with his horse because he knew that was what Seabiscuit needed to win. That jockey went back to get him unselfishly. Rita, I just think this represents thousands of people in our business who have been made to feel that they can't succeed for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. They aren't pretty enough, smart enough. They aren't building the business fast enough. And I think the key to this story is that Seabiscuit was in the race. He was trying and just wasn't able to keep up. He just needed that little extra support. See, this is such a personal thing to me because, as my I and Arbonne story mentioned, I lost my modeling agency due to an ex-partner and several things. I lost everything, my house, my car, my business, my income. And as a result of not being able to focus on my Arbonne business, I also lost my management status with Arbonne. I don't know, call me crazy. I sort of lost everything. I was a little overwhelmed, a little preoccupied. And the last thing I wanted to think about at that time was Arbonne. And the thing I needed the most was to hear from people letting me know that they still cared about me, even though I wasn't a top producer at that time. I had proven that I could run the race, and my potential never changed. And I had to tell you that the person who came back to get me was Doris Gleason. She's an area manager who wasn't even in my organization. She was the one who would call and say, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do to help? And I have to tell you that I owe my life, and I owe all of my accomplishments since that crisis to people like Doris Gleason, who unselfishly came back and helped get me back on my feet. And I would not be here today sharing the success in Arbonne, sharing all of this with all of you, if someone hadn't come back to get me. And that's the reason that this movie means so much to me. It just speaks volumes to me. Now, I'm not suggesting we should be dragging dead horses across the finish line. That jockey did not go back and grab Seabiscuit's reins and drag him across the finish line. What he did do is he went back to Seabiscuit's pace and asked, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do to help? You know, if a horse is standing in the barn and he isn't even on the racetrack trying to run, well, of course we need to let them go. If a consultant never comes to an event, they never order, they never sponsor, they never do anything, then we need to bless them and we need to release them and move on. We can't want it more for them than they want it for themselves. That's true. But what I am suggesting is that we have thousands of people in our business who join our bond and for some reason, get discouraged or frustrated because they just can't keep up. 
And when it happens, they just sort of stop and disappear. Maybe some crisis happens and they stop working the business and we just sort of let them go and move on because maybe they aren't able or willing to keep up the pace at that time. You see, no matter how much Seabiscuit wanted to race again, he broke a leg. It just wasn't the right time. But they never gave up on him. You know, they still cared about him even though he wasn't winning races. I've just come to learn that sometimes we need to unselfishly go back and find people in our business who are willing to work our bond, who are in the race but are having trouble keeping up. Maybe they're ordering and they are coming to some things, but they just aren't producing the results the way we think they should. Depending on how people were raised or programmed growing up or the life experiences they've had, they may need to be trained differently. They may need to be retrained and motivated just like Seabiscuit. I think that changing people's lives is about helping the champions in your organization who are trailing because they need to know you care about them. This is a life-changing business for all people, not just the ones who are in the front of the pack. And I think that people won't care what you think if they think you don't genuinely care. I tried this. I sort of put this theory to test, and in late August and September, I went back and started making personal contact with the people in my region, and the response was unbelievable. I started sending birthday cards to everyone in my region without mentioning Arbonne. I started sending personal notes to people, asking them if there was something that I could have done as an RVP that would have made them more interested or more eager to try Arbonne. What I found out is that they were overwhelmed and discouraged by all the stuff that had been thrown at them. I found out that they just didn't know where to begin. And, and it made me think sometimes after we've been in Arbonne for a while, maybe we forget how it is when you're brand new. And especially if you've never worked outside the home or you have no experience, you know, it can be a little scary. And as a result of hearing their comments and needs, my management team and I took all the great training materials out there and put them into bite-sized training pieces with audio support that are much less overwhelming, and we give them a day-to-day -day assignment, literally. Now I have people wanting to work the business, wanting to sponsor, wanting to listen to tapes that have never been interested before. My region growth in September was higher than it's been in over a year, and I believe that it's all because I went back and said, Hi, how are you doing? What would be the best way for me to train and motivate you? You see, I think the only people who are usually motivated by speed are the 95-mile-an-hour drivers, the type A personalities. And maybe we're leaving a huge group of consultants trailing the pack because maybe we really haven't asked them, how can we help them to learn? How can we motivate them? Because people learn at different paces, and they're motivated by different things. I know there are some consultants listening to this who are just feeling discouraged in Arbonne because they hear so much about people promoting quickly or because they've been in Arbonne for many years and haven't promoted. And if you're one of those people, I just want you to hear this statement. I am of the belief that 90 to 95 percent of the vice presidents in this company promoted to RVP within 6 to 12 months of the date they were able to get up to speed or made up their mind they were going to do it. So if you're just bummed out because you didn't promote in 6 to 12 months, I have a great idea for you. Just get out a new application, fill it out today, stick it on your wall where you can see it every day, get geared up and start over. Because with all the knowledge and experience you have in Arbonne now, you can hit the ground running. The title of our training today is Arbonne's Triple Crown. I think that in order to win the Arbonne Triple Crown and in order to truly be different than corporate America, we need to provide people with three things. Superior products, a way to achieve financial freedom, and outstanding personal growth opportunities. I want to win the Arbonne Triple Crown. I know we have superior products and I'm working to complete financial freedom, but I want to know when it's all done that I provided people with encouragement, support, and belief. And I want to begin that right now, right here. I know that there are people listening to this who have been held back in their lives. I know that they've been made to feel that they aren't pretty enough or they aren't smart enough or maybe that they aren't building fast enough. And if you're that person, I want to encourage you right here, right now, to believe that you are entitled to win this race no matter how long it takes you. Oh, there's no doubt that promoting faster is better. No doubt. But if you've broken a leg or you've had life traumas and you're just trying to get back on your feet, it's time to get back on the track and start running again. Because you are entitled to all the benefits that Arbonne has to offer, and you can come from the back of the pack and promote. It is not too late. 
I want you all to know that you can achieve, that you can overcome life's broken legs, and that you too can be an Arbon Triple Crown winner. Rita, that's all that I wanted to share today, and I'm going to turn the call back over to you now. That's all. I've I've been sobbing <laughs> listening. I got so choked up because I could think of people that have had setbacks. Uh, and Deborah, as I listen to you, and and you are Sea Biscuit to me because you have overcome so many challenges. What an awesome example you have set.